So, next 30 minutes, uh, we'll discuss MLOps lifecycle, what it is, and I want to focus more on um, questions that you would want to ask when you start machine learning project and questions in each of these particular stages in this life cycle. Less related to the actual technical implementation because it varies a lot and no sense to discuss it. And also, uh, yeah, we'll make some comparison between MLOps and DevOps and in the end, just some discussion and notes about team, uh, it's like machine learning team roles and responsibilities. I found it quite fascinating uh, to discuss this topic these days. And tooling, yeah, but it will be super brief. So what is MLOps? Uh, okay. Oh, it works. Cool. So, yes, technical issues, yeah. So MLOps is a set of the processes that you would like to have in place in order to move your um, models that you design in Jupyter Notebook to something that can be actually, yeah, used by your customers and bring the value to your organization. There's more complex uh, definition here, but yeah, in a nutshell, a set of processes and yeah, also technologies and capabilities and there's a bunch of people involved. And two key things is that you want to do it rapidly, which means you don't want to start project and then after eight months to have something in production. You maybe want to have something in production within the first month. And reliably, which means, yeah, as soon as you put your uh, XGBoost model and then the actual data hits it and everything fails and nothing is working, you don't want that. You want to have it reliable. And one more important part to say is that I'm not going to discuss data ops. Yeah, for those who, okay. So we, yeah, data ops is about the data. So it's a completely different topic. It's more on, um, yeah, if you're in a big organization, there's a separate team preparing your data, do all the quality checks, putting it to the data warehouse or data lake. And MLOps team is not bothered with that at all. They are just customers. They just consuming that, yeah, best case scenario. Uh, without data ops, yeah. If you don't have it or you never thought about it, yeah, you can just keep this talk and first focus on the data ops. All other thing doesn't make any sense without it in place. But yeah, data ops is about, uh, yeah, data, prepared data, so. <laughs> so uh, back to MLOps. So this uh, wheel of fortune or, I don't know, cycle of existence, call it whatever. So you have several processes around MLOps that needs to be in place and the top one, well, the top one, it's machine learning development, we all know what it is. So it's, you, you see it, you create your training pipeline, um, maybe do some tests if you're really into that, but usually it's just a bunch of steps in a Jupyter notebook and then it's uh, called a pipeline and we all doing that for already a lot of years. Then another thing, oh, it's like strange clicker. Training operationalization. So this, this thing is that when you have your pipeline, but then you can take it and put it in some system that can run it automatically. So for example, to system that supports continuous integration and continuous deployment, something that you can later on run on some trigger or something. This is more like kind of a next step. So you take your pipeline, which could be whatever, um, I don't know, airflow pipeline or whatever, and you put it like in a system that can deploy it on demand or on the trigger or on the schedule. So that's all about that. Um, continuous training, that's a bit of a glitch here. Okay, so this one, it's the set of processes how you would like to run this continuous uh, training, how you want to run this pipeline that's operationalized already. So um, here you would like to think about, okay, uh, should I check my data? If something wrong with the data that's coming to the production part, like, okay, should I retrain it? Where should I retrain it? What kind of triggers I would like to put? So that part is all about that. And um, yeah, the simple thing is the code changes. So if your data scientist change the pipeline or hyperparameters or something, you would like to run it all and to have updated version of the model registered in some model registry. Deployment. Again, boring stuff, packaging, testing, and deploying it to some serving environment. You, yeah, we have several, like development environment. It's al always nice to have development environment, like a full cycle where your data scientist can also deploy it somewhere and check that it works. Prediction serving, so it's more related already to 
actual production environment. It's also a separate process that you would like to follow. And then here are also stakeholders involved. They would like to see what's going on. It's not only for your internal team, but also for someone else outside. Yeah, and the last thing is monitoring. So here are a bunch of things that you would like to monitor. Business metrics, software metrics, uh, machine learning metrics, whatever. Uh, that's kind of the process. But still, it's a wrong representation because it's not cycle in real life. You see that there's a data and model management. That's the core part where all your model artifacts are going, all the, uh, all the registered models, and also the data that you are pre-processing. It's all there. It's in the, in the center. Uh, there's another view for the same thing. And this, I think, a bit better because here you can see the outputs of the each step more in detail, and it's also super clear that it's not a waterfall process. It's not even like highly iterative process. It's super iterative process. So you can basically go at any moment in time, you can return back to the machine learning development, You can, which means you need to change something in your uh, experimentation. At any time, you can retrain your model. At any time, you would like to redeploy it. A lot of moving pieces. So, and yeah. The outputs I already mentioned, but essentially, yeah, code configuration after you did your experimentation, then pipeline uh, from continuous training, you just register your model. Um, and serving, yeah, that's all fascinating, but the steps should be there. Someone from the ops side in your team should do that. That's the workflow. Then, yeah, so what I wanted to emphasize before we go into the really details of uh, MLOps as a process is that the first stage when you start doing anything in machine learning is a scoping. So there's a room like this, you have your solution architect, you have business stakeholder, you have maybe some development team discussing things, right? So, and at this point in time, you can kill already 80% of the machine learning projects and just do something else, you know? Just don't waste time on it. So that's really important. And here, what kind of questions you need to ask, it's also important. So. I'm not going to read it, but essentially, you may have in your organization several projects that you would like to work on, right? Starting from, um, I don't know, improving the customer experience, maybe working on the databases, maybe doing some internal uh, improvements, and you're all thinking about AI, right? Okay, can I apply AI there, there, there? So there should be some thinking how to prioritize that. I will link in the references some material that you can read about that, but it's a separate thing that you really need to put effort. Which project to pick? that will improve your um, company, essentially. Another thing is what kind of metrics for success uh, you define. So I don't know. Different people interested in different things, right? DevOps people, they may be interested, like in general, ops people, they're interested in latency, in throughput, whatever, how to deploy Kubernetes cluster, YAML files, and all the stuff. And um, business people, they don't speak language of technical people, right? Like machine learning engineers saying like, hmm, my RMSC is good. And then a uh, business person is like, so what? Okay, fine. So you need to ask those questions and also in terms of planning, like what kind of people you have. I saw projects starting that where you need to spin up, I don't know, Kubernetes cluster, build all, th all that thing from scratch. And then there's only one data scientist that barely knows uh, anything else except Jupyter Notebook. So yeah, put some proper people on the project. Timeline as well is important. So, um, yeah, what's important more than that is that to separate problem identification from solution. You know that every month we have a new transformer architecture coming, right? And then like, ah, we can apply it to everything, right? These days, uh, computer vision, uh, natural language processing, everything. So, and people like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Just discuss what you're actually trying to solve. If you can avoid machine learning, do it. You will save money, time for everyone. Um, yeah, yeah, probably I'm not supposed to talk uh, like that, right? Uh, and then another thing is that, that everyone is happy about the success metrics. So you build that bridge between your machine learning engineers and the business stakeholders. Next one. Yeah, that's like in the end, when you're done, you ask again that question. Like, um, let's see. Data, that's fascinating part. So, um, that's the questions that you need to ask. So you need to understand, I will say obvious things now. You need to understand what's your input data and what actually you are predicting. That's like the, the best of it. 
And then more tricky is that in which situation you are, whether you have small data set or big data set. Why it's important? It affects other things, right? Like it affects your labeling strategy. If you have small data set and it's difficult to obtain, maybe you need to involve a lot of subject matter experts or it's just pricey, you cannot outsource it or whatever. You need to make sure that the quality of your labels is great. So it's like completely different when you have huge data, like labeled, yeah, reliably, but you can work with that, right? You can mangle it, you can apply data augmentation techniques to that. So you need to identify that from the beginning. Then structured, unstructured data, also important, also in terms of labeling. It's way easier to label unstructured data. Images, yeah, even machine learning engineer can label that, right, with some small instructions. If you have uh, structured data, which is like, yeah, CSV table with 1,000 features and some like zero, one in the end, like, yeah, good luck with that. It's uh, almost impossible. Um, what else? Yeah, you need to be aware of the data lineage, so the, the steps. Usually, machine learning is not the first thing that company is implementing. You may have already a lot of things in your pipeline and you need to plug it in. So you need to know where exactly you're plugging it in because when it breaks, you, you will know like, okay, that's maybe it's not your fault. It's fault of downstream or upstream systems. So that's uh, also important question. Um, yeah, whether your data set, the data set is balanced or not, I found it is also really important because this imbalanced data sets, they affect performance a lot and you need to know if it's balanced, how to tackle it. There are multiple methods for that, but yeah, just be aware how to handle data errors. This one important because usually you have like a snippet of the data set, CSV file, you open Jupyter notebook, you work there, but you kind of, yeah, rarely ask a question, what will happen if the schema will change of this data set? What will happen if someone will add new category there? How I will track it? And all these issues, they usually discovered when your model deployed in production, when it's too late. So, and uh, it's better if you start asking these questions in advance. Then how fast your data is changing? Also, um, for example, customer data is not changing that often, but uh, if you work with manufacturing plant or whatever, they may add things every week. So this will also affect decisions later on. Um, yeah, another thing, how to measure and act on data drift. So data drift is the situation when you train your model on one thing, but then production data distributed differently and then your model is not predicting it well, which means, yeah, it's not a good thing. So you need to have some ideas and methods how you will mitigate the drift already on this stage. Um, yeah, I think one advice, uh, it's important to incorporate as much as possible metadata for your data. It will help you a lot and also it will help you uh, explaining to your customers in the end, like, okay, why your model is not working. Sometimes I've been in a situation when people were saying like, hmm, your model is not working, everything is uh, broken completely. I look in the metadata, everything works perfectly, and I see that um, actually the equipment is broken. So we had the camera installed, and camera was just closed. So it was like black image coming into the system, and it was like, hmm, it's not predicting anything. Like, yeah, because you're not sending any data. And then in metadata, you can see some characteristics of your input data, for example, as well. Collect your data fast, if possible. So this is to the moment of like, okay, uh, don't wait three months before someone will give you that CSV file and then you start doing that. If Just don't start the project, just leave them be. And when they are done, when they're ready with the data, you can actually start doing something. And iterate in the model development cycle faster. So this is about data. Okay, modeling, let me just put it, everything here on the slide. Keep clicking. Okay. So modeling, um, obvious things for some people, I guess. But um, yeah, in the first week, when you already know that the project will fly, you have some ideas that, yeah. Just start with literature search, check blogs, etc. I always suggest to look at open source because it's already done. Just take it, you run it, you see first results. Uh, overfit a small training data set first. I think that's a common recommendation when you train uh, neural networks. So overfit the one batch to see that your uh, neural network can actually learn small sample. Overfit on that because if it can't, there are some problems in algorithm, technical problems that you need to solve. After some time, yeah, you may start thinking about explainability and uh, this is something that, yeah, some people saying that you need to think about that in production. I think you need to think about it when you're in Jupyter Notebook. So 
apply something like, yeah, explainability is, is equal to SHAP these days, right? Like SHAP is everywhere. Uh, for neural networks that on computer vision, in the compu computer vision world, you can apply other things, gradient-based methods, ablations, whatever, but have it in your training pipeline. Create a strategy to monitor concept drift. So concept drift, it's another beast. It's basically when your uh, mapping is changing over time. So I think, yeah, you have same house uh, size and it's price changing due to inflation. So you need to, this is to the, mo to the point when you have to retrain your model. So there should be a trigger. As soon as you detect concept drift, the model is retrained on the new data and model is updated. So, but also take that into account. What else? Uh, challenges, do well on the training data set. Easy, we can all overfit on the training data set. Then uh, do well on the validation and test set is also, uh, yeah, well, a bit more tricky, but we also can do that. We also can do something with that and it will work well. Do well on the business metrics, that's hard. So, good luck. Um, another thing is, um, yeah, so don't be obsessed without the algorithms these days. So, uh, like the typical like trap that, okay, I tried random forest, I tried uh, gradient boosted trees, neural network, transformer, hmm, transformer is not really working, let's try another transformer. Better invest in the, in the data, there's a lot of discussions, especially this year about data centric uh, AI that you focus on your data first, and then when you focus on your model later on, especially if you're not doing a research, because yeah, if you're doing a research, maybe you're interested in, in the models and developing the models, but in, in industry, it's barely the case. Uh, take deployment constraints into account after you establish a baseline. This is about the freedom for your data scientists. So instead of saying like, hmm, your algorithm should run on this lambda function within 20 milliseconds, just give them to do whatever they want and optimization comes afterwards. So it's always possible to tweak these uh, deployment uh, requirements later on. Um, what else? Yeah, and machine learning is an iterative process. So it's mostly for, I guess, uh, managers, if there's any managers, because uh, still a lot of people believe that you do it once and then you take the pickle file, you deploy it on the server and it works forever. That's not the case. Okay, deployment. Let's put a lot of boring words here. Yeah, so on deployment, uh, you need to think about whether it's real time or batch. Completely different stories require completely, well, different level of skills in your team. Batch workloads way easier than real time. Uh, you need to decide whether you deploy uh, in the cloud or on the earth or on the edge or in your on-prem. Um, that could be, yeah, also something that you need to realize before you start. Compute resources, whether you need GPU, CPU, TPU, memory, whatever, latency, throughput, some logging, some security and privacy part. Um, deployment patterns. So for about deployment patterns, I think for AI, this kind of diagram is uh, relevant. So you first start when someone is doing the process manually. So it's like person looking in the Excel spreadsheet, let's assume. And then you want to s automate something. So you run some chatbot or some kind of process in a shadow mode that's not really affecting a user anyhow. It's just running and then you check how it's performing. And then as soon as it's performing well, you're moving it from shadow mode to AI assistant. So for the person that in Excel, like your chatbot is saying like, hmm, hey, maybe you want to ask me and delete Excel from your laptop. And then there's a partial automation and full automation, but it's more like when you substitute the particular process with the AI uh, for one use case. So for example, you put quality control station in the factory on one line and it's fully working and, you, and your operator's not bothered and then you substitute the whole station. Uh, whole factory checking process with AI. So I think most common ways where to stop it's assistance and uh, partial automation. Full automation is still, yeah, tricky. And deployment is also an iterative process because modeling is an iterative process. So let's see. Monitoring and observability. Hmm. Okay, so this one, uh, if you, took into account everything that I said before, concept drift, data drift, software metrics, business metrics beforehand, this step is super easy because essentially monitoring is just, yeah, it's just dashboard, right? Like if you're an open source, you use Grafana. If you're in Azure, you use Log Analytics. If you're in AWS, you use, I don't know, what's that, QuickSight. So it doesn't matter, literally. If you know what to put in the dashboard and to whom to show it, that's most important part. So you want to show it to your data scientists, you want to show it to your business stakeholders, 
and to your uh, infrastructure DevOps engineers, I guess. So, and the things that should be there, yeah, they're on the slide, software metrics, uh, drift, data quality data, or some performance analysis for machine learning models, so machine learning metrics, and um, uh, in case like, yeah, explainability is also there, so that for example, when something is happening in production, like one feature start deviating in terms of in distribution from the one that you have in the test, you can see it in that dashboard, plus you can see, for example, from the SHAP, you can see how much that change in the data drift influencing the prediction of that model. So the, you need to put some thinking in how to build that dashboard. But yeah, the old things are there. Yeah, you can brainstorm, brainstorm with your team to think like, okay, maybe there's some special metrics that I want to put there or yeah, some particular requirements, whatever. And uh, more on observability uh, part because okay, dashboard is there, it's showing that everything is uh, ruined in production and uh, all metrics are off. What to do with that because no one is looking at the dashboard, right? You need uh, alerting functionality. So you need to notify relevant stakeholders, data scientists, engineers, about things that are going on within your system. And yeah, I think all the systems that I mentioned, they support that. Okay, monitor software. Yeah, that's I already mentioned. So you need to monitor literally everything. Machine learning, ops, and DevOps. So how much time I still have? Yeah, that's all. So this one is really interesting because people like, now we're in the world of uh, everything ops, right? You just take ops world and you are, attach it to anything and then it's a new thing. So um, the difference is in the data. So if you look, for example, in traditional application, it's purely logical. Every blocks, everything is explainable. You can open any component and yeah, look into that and it's done, right? In machine learning a world, everything is empirical. So everything depends what your data scientist is doing in that Jupyter notebooks in the end, right? You can build all the clusters, all the infrastructure around that, but the most important part is that model in the end, how it performs, is it really working or not? And it's a bit of the magic and we know all, right? right? It's like you're experimenting a lot, you're trying different approaches and in the end something is working. So that's the difference. That's why you cannot just take DevOps as a, as a methodology and apply to machine learning world because you need to take into account like this kind of randomness and the empirical way of working for machine learning workloads. So uh, that one, this picture is explaining basically the layers that you would want to have and some of these things, yeah, they are coming from the DevOps world, right? You need foundational infrastructure, you need your data, you need some compute, you need orchestration, Versioning comes also from DevOps for your data, for your model. What else? Yeah, for your code, obviously. And uh, yeah, software architecture as well. Uh, those things that I mentioned, it's the things that data scientists don't care at all. They only care about model development, feature engineering, and maybe model operations, like, slightly. So that's where these two worlds are attached to each other. So, and what's important on that is that, uh, let's say you have a, data scientist that's, uh, yeah, I think it's on the next one. I don't know, okay, I will go later to that. So this one is another thing. This is about uh, roles and responsibilities in machine learning team. So I was looking, uh, when I was making the slide, I was thinking like, okay, we have DevOps, model ops, DevSec ops, I don't know. And I thought like, okay, I'll call it XOps, and then I Google this, and these things exist actually, we have XOps now as well. So if someone is writing blogs about that, like whether it's a hype or whatever, and it's like, mm, okay, fine. So what about this unicorn? Yeah, pe some people trying to hire those guys, in, those guys in the team, right? They want a person to understand YAML, to write uh, manifest files for Kubernetes, then uh, open Jupyter Notebook, take latest transformer model, train it on the data set, then also deploy it, then also attend the stand-up, because of course you need to manage your team, right? But actually it's a small team, so it's like one person, so you probably can skip stand-ups, but you still need agile. <laughs> That's like for sure. So don't do that. Don't, don't hire, don't look for such people because I saw a lot of vacancies doing that. You will not find such person. It's a mythology. So in reality, um, we have a gradient. So a lot of people, they're all different. So you have, and, and there's a two access to that, right? Like you have machine learning knowledge and you have software engineering knowledge. And depends in which organization you are, you can cherry pick 
who you want. Well, actually not, you cannot cherry pick because machine learning engineers are super difficult to hire because they are kind of, they're on the both, both worlds. Uh, but I just pick one example, so, mm. yeah. So this example is that when we have some product and we would like to embed the machine learning functionality into that product. So I think it's quite obvious that software skills in this case are prioritized over the research skills. And then, yeah, as I mentioned, machine learning team is not managing the data, so you have a separate team doing all the data ops and everything. And then machine learning engineers own the models that they deploy. So in this situation, it's quite clear that you probably need people like machine learning engineers, right? You need a DevOps to kind of operate around the model. Um, I would say that the best recommendation always is that if you don't have anyone in the team, start with data engineer because someone have to move the data around even though if you have a separate data ops team, someone have to communicate with them, bring it in your system, do something with that. So having a data engineer in the team, it's really, really important. Um, but yeah, others like data scientists, it's umbrella term, always clarify what people mean about data scientists. As I said, it, it varies from like writing macros uh, expressions in uh, Excel to Kubernetes clusters. So don't like this term. So that's, uh, be careful with that. And um, yeah, let me see. And there's another story that I wanted to, uh, to briefly throw on you is that some people saying that data scientists should be end to end. So it's to back to that unicorn discussion. But uh, let's just stop for a second and stop shaming those people, but uh, think about the benefits. So imagine that you are one data scientist on the project. The advantage is that you have ownership of everything, right? You know where the data coming from, what's going on with the data, how is it deployed, you know all the metrics, you own the process, which means you also iterate fast and you learn fast in such environment. And also it's reduced communication and collaboration overhead because when uh, you have data, data engineer that builds some table in SQL and then throw it to data scientist, data scientist looks in that and then, okay, I will do it in R and it's doing something in R and then move it to machine learning engineer and machine learning engineer like, okay, R, no way. So they write everything in Go, for example. And then you like, uh, okay, that's, that's a lot of traction in the process. But as I mentioned, the problem is these guys, right? Like you're thinking, okay, I'm data scientist. Now I need to know low level infrastructure, pipelines, all these things. And you're like, no, right? What to do? So I found a really good opportunity in that discussion and it's on the tooling side. And if it appears, yeah, this is a good example. Who knows Metaflow? Okay, some people, I will just uh, follow up on that. So basically, the problem is tooling. So if data scientist has a tool that allow him to deploy things, not writing YAML files or not deploying Kubernetes clusters, but just to deploy, then in the language that data scientist knows, which is Python, well, sorry, our people. Uh, but this is basically an example how things can work in future. So Metaflow, for those who in an AWS, like, if you are vendor locked on AWS, you can try that because th they support a lot of workloads in uh, AWS. But essentially, this is kind of a pipeline, right? So you have a class, uh, it's uh, inherited from some flow spec. But what I want to emphasize, there's a laser here, right? That's not visible. Okay, so there's the decorators there, right? You see spe uh, step decorator, you see batch decorator, you see conda decorator. So these things allows you to declare a particular step in a way that it will then later on be uh, executed in the cloud environment. From the data scientist point of view, you just need to configure one file. It also can be configured by your engineer for you. But you just need to specify, okay, I need four GPUs or 100 maybe. You're maybe in your language models, then you need a lot. And how much memory you need and the libraries also. And in that sense, you have one file and it will enable data scientists to work end to end essentially, right? So you do need to ask someone uh, to provide a particular uh, environment for you because we have the serverless compute, well, serverless, right? You ask, for example, this batch decorator will call AWS batch service. So what that service is doing is just taking your code, running it in a Docker container and uh, put the results, for example, to S3. Perfect, right? Everything can be configured, okay. 
highly recommend that, especially in the AWS. They also support Kubernetes uh, integration. So for ops people there, it's like really cool thing to give to your data scientists and make them more autonomous. Ooh. Yeah, questions, if you have any, and uh, this is the references that I highly recommend to, uh, to take a look on. They will answer a lot of things that you are wondering about MLOps as a process. Thanks, uh, Vladimir. Questions? Uh, thanks for the amazing presentation. I do have a question because I missed a important part actually during the entire ML, ML ops cycle, I think A-B testing, because uh, before you really actually push anything to production, you have to kind of like uh, doing uh, like a, let's say the, your hypothesis and test actually based on your, let's say new features actually enabled compared mm -hmm. to that, let's say non hypothesis you have. So, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, uh, how did you actually view that as part of the ML ops? Actually, is this actually happens at the uh, that deployment stage? Actually, you're mentioning already, or is like happening after that? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's like one particular example how you can start with deployment, right? So A/B testing is definitely in the deployment stage. So I just and yeah, I cannot go in all possible ways how you want to deploy, but yeah. A-B testing is there indeed on the deployment stage. So, because of versioning you do everywhere, starting from your experiments on the machine learning experimentation part. So your data scientists, they already have to version something uh, on that side. So. Sorry. So, uh, uh, because you are talking about ops, right? So, there's like, a, there's like a flow mm -hmm. deliver. You're actually mentioning from the uh, data ops to ML ops to the DevOps, right? Um, if you do the A/B A/B testing at end of the ML ops, how you actually just uh, seamlessly, continuously deliver to the people actually responsible for the, let's say. Uh, downstream part? Uh, well, at least what I'm trying to do also at, uh, at work is that data scientists should own the process, right? Mm -hmm. So you can deploy in your development environment, for example, for development endpoints, your model already, and you can already expose it to some customers, right? And see how it's working. Mm -hmm. And then at some point in time, when your model is showing good results, you can promote it to production. But there's no walls between, I mean, we used to work like that, right? You do yeah. something and then you throw over the wall, like those guys in that department will do that. No, uh, they see everything. And the go But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have uh, um, infrastructure people on your project. You should, they will help data scientists to see this flow end to end. So it's a bit different approach instead of like separating walls and then waiting several months, one wine team will, if you put it in the backlog, you know, like, okay, we do that in three months, we will create a SQL table for you, you can wait. So, yeah, but yeah, that's 